Well, greetings friends and welcome back. And today, buttons and bugs. Now, for those of you who don't know just yet, I am a massive nerd and I've been painting miniatures since I was about 12 and playing Gloomhaven and Frosthaven and Jaws of the Lion and all the other accoutrement type games since the moment they came out. Well, actually, to be fair, a friend of mine introduced me to Gloomhaven. I had no idea what the hell it was and I was like, oh my God, and I lost my mind. So uh, as a result then, I bought Gloomhaven, then bought Frosthaven, then bought uh, Crimson Scales, then Jaws of the Lion, and obviously now Buttons and Bugs, and the other stuff that I'll show you later. Hmm, it's like I like it or something. So my backer kit version of Buttons and Bugs has arrived. Uh, let's have a look at it. Now, the other thing I will say is that this is sealed in the box. So I am going to do an unboxing at the end of this video. So if you wanna unbox, video bit, then watch at the end. But for right now, let's jump into the review. And here she is, all painted up, your friend and mine, the hidden silent knife. Oh my God, I'm seriously never gonna get used to this name. <laughs> uh, really quite fun to paint, actually, this one. It um, only took about 20 odd minutes, maybe from start to finish. Oh my God, so fiddly. Um, yeah, probably only about 20 minutes start to finish. Got to lay down a couple of different colors exclusively painted with uh, speed paints, uh, for better or worse, but um, I think it gives a pretty good result, especially on the face and some of the smaller details where, you know, there's no way that I was spent hundreds of hours or even tens of hours trying to get the face and everything right uh, using regular paint. And here's a bit more of your traditional kind of tabletop view of this little one. Uh, there is a small chip on her hair uh, which just happened because the, the figure fell down and got chipped on the floor. So that's the only problem with the speed paints is that they are you know, quite fragile. If you, if you touch them the wrong way, they will kind of chip off pretty quickly. But other than that, I'm pretty happy with the results. I quite like the buttons that they're all standing on. That's pretty cool. I tried to match the color uh, to some extent to what she has on her card, which I think worked out okay. Um, I'll obviously do the same with the other ones as well. So we've got our painted, uh, not scoundrel, silent knife. Oh, man, it's gonna take forever for me to learn that. Poised and positioned, uh, ready to start mission two. I figure every other tutorial video shows you mission one, so let's go for mission two. Now here's where I wanna point one of the biggest problems with this kit so far, and that is specifically these two health tracker tokens. So the one on the right is meant to be for green, the one on the left is meant to be for blue, but I don't know about you, but the uh, colors are damn near the same as far as I'm concerned. There've been also people online complaining about the fact that the cubes, especially the purple and blue, are really close together as well. And just the other day, Sir Fellafair did send an email addressing some of this, uh, specifically saying that we'll be working with the manufacturer to address card wrapping, health dial colors, and a handful of other quality of life adjustments in the second printing which will be sold in retail at a higher price than what was offered during the backer kit campaign. Which is lovely, but um, well, lovely for the retail guys, but uh, I still paid good money for this. And um, surely this kind of stuff was play tested, but apparently not. So here it is set up. You can see that it's sort of within the span of about two hand widths and well, two hand widths wide and about four in total up and down or a forearm length or whatever you wanna say. <laughs> that's about the space that you need if you're arranging it in the same way that I am. All right, let's get cracking. So I'm gonna select uh, Thief Snack and Smoke Bomb as my first two, and I'm gonna go with an initiative of 12. I'll then roll for the initiative of the Bandit, who goes at 70, and the Archer, who will go at 16. So I still get to go before them. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is activate Thieves Snack, which says the next time an enemy enters a hex within two of me, it suffers three damage. So I'm gonna activate that. And then I'm gonna move four, one, two, three to over here and control the enemy for one to make the blue uh, archer move into that trap, suffering one damage. And then of course they have entered a hex within two of me, so they suffer a further three. One, two, three. Now someone might be yelling at me that that's not kosher, but that's the way I'm playing it. <laughs> so first the bandit archer right next to me will move one back and will attack me for two with a range of two. 
ouch, with a plus, so that's for three. Flip the side. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get used to that at some point. And the other banded archer will just move their one, not being able to do anything else. Now the banded guard could get to me with four either way, so I'm just gonna select that he goes that way and stays there. And that's the end of the turn. All right, next turn, I'm gonna select my other two A-sides. So I'm gonna go Venom, Shiv, and Quick Reflexes. Uh, initiative is terrible, so I'm hoping for crappy rolls. So it's 60 and 64, I'm gonna go for 60 as my initiative. And then we'll roll for the others. So Bandit Archer, oops, knocks the thing out, gets a plus. So they're luckily at 64. And Bandit Guard at 50. Okay, so the Bandit Guard will get to go before me. So they move into hand-to-hand -hand range and attack me for two. For <laughs> four, ouch. That's unhelpful. Okay, then it's my turn. So I'm going to use my uh, move two to just go to there and attack the blue bandit archer for three. For three, which means they're dead. Move that down one. And then I have a move of five, which I'm just going to use to move to about there. Uh, maybe one more. How far do the bandit guards move? They can move two at a max. Yep, so if I move to three, then they're gonna be out of range for the next one. Now those are both A sides, so they also get flipped. And then we've got the other bandit archer who would just do a ranged attack if they could, which they can't, so that's the end of the turn. Okay, this turn I'm going to play Throwing Knives and Special Mixture with an initiative of 38. So we'll go Banded Guards first. They go at 70, well he goes at 70, and the remaining Archer stays at 64. Okay, so I get to go first, so I'm going to heal myself for three, because I'm in pain. And then I'm gonna activate this, which is the next source of damage that I would suffer, I negate it. So this card now goes into the discard pile, and this one essentially goes into active. So then Bandit Archer goes next, again tries to shoot me at a range of three, can't get me, so that's the end of that turn. And then the Bandit Guard, with their initiative of 70, gonna move one, two, try and get into melee combat, and can't, so that's the end of that turn. Now already I can see I haven't played this super well because my B-sides would be both benefit from um, having, uh, having darkness. And I can't remember whether just the fact that I've got this one up here activated actually gives me darkness seeing as though it's visible. But I'm gonna say that it doesn't because uh, that would probably be unfair. So I'm just gonna do uh, 11 and so I'm just gonna do a single out. There's gonna be my main attack and a move of four and a retaliate of one. So my initiative is going to be 11. We'll roll for the guards initiative for 50 and the banded archer for 31. All right, so I'm just going to, uh, obviously I'm going first. I'm just going to move one. I'm going to attack him for uh, a regular three plus I'm on retaliate one for the rest of the turn. Okay, so that's a plus. So that's plus two, five plus, uh, sorry, five total. Work out which one's the green one. God, I realize I've already made a mistake somewhere along the line. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter, that banded archer is uninjured, but I realize I've done the wrong color. See, so this is, this is one of the problems. We'll get rid of, that's blue, allegedly. That is allegedly blue. We'll get rid of blue then, we'll keep him. He's uninjured, so it doesn't matter, but the colors are not great, especially on those health dials. Okay, so my retaliate of one is active as well, and this was another B card, so that goes into discard. Now the Banded Archer's turn, they will just move one, trying to get to me, can't, that's the end of their turn. And the Banded Guard will move up to one, which he doesn't have to, and will attack me for two. Okay, so he, he attacks me, I rolled a zero, it's actually immaterial because um, I've got my negate damage anyway, so I suffered no damage, that goes into discard, then he also suffers one damage because of my retaliate of one. So he's now down to two. And that's the end of the turn. 
So now all of my discard cards get shuffled and one gets picked at random to be discard, uh, to be lost, uh, which will be that one. That's my only healing card, so that could be a problem. And then we're back to the A side for these three. So an obvious choice here, we're gonna go Thief Snack and Smoke Bomb to go invisible and then attack for three as well while I'm standing there. So let's go for it, so initiative of 12, we'll go for the Bandits, they're on 30, and we'll go for the Archers on 31. Cool, so I get to go first, so I'm invisible. And then uh, I'm just going to attack for the standard three here. Okay, so that'd be a four, which means Mr. Bandit is dead. And that moves down one. So we're gonna take the Bandit Guards away completely because otherwise I'll just be confused for no reason. All right, she will move one and one, two, three. I'm still one out of range, so that's the end of the turn. These were both A sides, so they'll now get flipped. Well, technically, I am still invisible. So they, that one doesn't get flipped, that one goes into active. And this is where you start running out of cards really quickly, which becomes <laughs> yeah, a bit of an issue. All right, so I'm gonna go on initiative 60 this time, because I'm invisible for this turn. Let's roll initiative for the bandit. Cool, they stay at 31, which means literally nothing happens. They just stand there going, which way did they go? And then I'm gonna run up to them with my move of five and attack them for three, with a, uh, with a poison, but because we're on this row here with the miss, I'm gonna use my Sparrow, Sparrow Skull Helm to gain advantage for my attack. So it's an attack of three with a zero or with a plus. So it's an attack of four, so they're down to three and they are poisoned. So the best place really to put the poison is on the actual wound counter itself because otherwise it won't make much sense to you. Plus I forgot to add the plus one because I'm now currently invisible still. So they're now down to two. It's really hard to keep a track of everything that you're doing in this game as it is with normal Gloomhaven, but with this one in particular. All right, so finally, we're gonna move this one down one and we are looking in reasonably good shape. We're right next to um, old mate, so potentially they would get disadvantage if they were to try and shoot me, so we'll see how that goes. Obviously I've only got one card left, so I'm gonna have to discard this one. Well, my only option is to go with 85 or 62 for my initiative, so I'm just gonna go for 62, hoping for a crappy roll from, hey, we got another crappy roll. So they're on 64, which means they get to go first, and they're poisoned. So we should be in a good position, hopefully. So this is the idea for the coup de grace. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, attack of five here using the uh, darkness that's infused at the moment. And they're obviously poisoned, but it's just a straight attack of five. I can't miss. So really, I mean, they're dead. There's <laughs> no question about that. So that's it, scenario one. Now I'm sure that I made a mistake or two during that playthrough uh, for a couple of reasons, not the least of which being that, uh, you know, I'm trying to film it at the same time. So please tell me what I did wrong in the comments below. And now we'll travel back in time for the unboxing. Right, that was for the one person who will get that reference. And now let's unbox this thing. Now, because I'm on YouTube, it also means that I'm not allowed to open any box unless I use a stupidly ostentatious knife. So this is the one we're gonna to use today. <laughs> it's twice the size of the box I'm unboxing. And very carefully, ugh, frightening. Okay, let's check it out. So first of all, I know it's really hard to talk about scale when it comes to this thing. Um, I don't know, standard mug. <laughs> it is really, really tiny. It's definitely a travel sized game that you could definitely fit in your luggage, even your laptop bag, although it's a little bit thick for that, but certainly you could take it with you on a plane. I'd love to see someone bust this out on a plane tray table. Failing that, let's get into it. Welcome to the glory of the POV shot. Mmm, fancy. Right, so <laughs> Buttons and Bugs really is tiny. Uh, it's hard to explain exactly the size of it. Um, really small, yep. Wow, amazing content, Rob. All right, 
So the first thing that you will see as you open up the edges, now I literally have not seen inside this box myself, so you're joining me on this, is that you will have various textures from the Gloomhaven games itself uh, around the outside. Well, two, wood and stone. I feel like there could have been more. Okay, let's see what greets us as we open the box. Well, unsurprisingly, a learn to play guide, which is always good. Uh, it is also very tiny, uh, but mighty. Uh, we're not gonna flick through all of the pages. Obviously, this can be read at your leisure. I'm sure there are PDFs of this online if you want to skip ahead and, uh, and just see what it actually is and how to play a scenario. And there we go. So, well, actually, I say that I'm not gonna flick through all the pages. I'm pretty much there now. So I'm just gonna finish it off. If you're really super duper keen on reading it in advance and you wanna do it here, then, you know, rewind, pause the video, etc. Enjoy yourself, fill your boots, whatever it is you wanna do. Good times. All right, inside, you then have a little baggie. And this little baggie has got little squares in it. Now, these will obviously be useful for marking the position of various things in the game as will become very obvious to you if you have not worked out that part already from other reviews. So for the moment, we'll pop them over there. Next up are our tiny but mighty mercenaries. Oh my God, they are small. <laughs> okay. As I say to you, I have not seen these guys before. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's full on tiny. Look at that guy. Holy crap. That's really cool. In fact, <laughs> I bought over a painting stand and I wager that even on the smaller setting, there is, yeah, no way that they will fit. Look how much empty space there is <laughs> around that stand. Okay, that's gonna be cool. One really interesting thing about these guys is that, oh, let's pick up a different one because you've seen that one already, is that they are obviously based on the, the newer sculpts, uh, the newer versions of the starting characters which is cool. Um, and they are obviously micro, micro scale. So this is gonna be fun to paint. I generally paint everything with speed paints, which means that potentially it will be ever so slightly easier. But there is a fair bit of detail to these guys, I have to say. Uh, yeah, they look awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna be using a, a tiny micro brush and uh, obviously my speed paints to get through this painting process. Come on, focus. I mean, look, a professional would have put this on manual focus and dialed it all in, but uh, yeah, this is a one-man band you're talking to, so, you know, it's, this is as professional as it gets for now. Uh, again, different buttons that they're actually standing on, which is pretty cool. This one's got a different outside sort of ridged texture to it. Loving that, digging it. And find a little guy. Wow, these guys are so small. Like, look up against my thumbnail. <laughs> it's just, just taller than my thumb nail. Okay, amazing. Let's see what's next. So next up, we have our modification die with its zero, one, plus uh, sides. Again, it's not a standard size die. This is a tiny dice. I wanna say, it's like 70% the size of like a Warhammer 40K dice. So about half the size of a standard D6, maybe, maybe a little bit even smaller. And here we have the health tracker for the hero and for the four different colored enemies. There's some issues with these, so we'll talk about those in just a minute. Let's move on. Then moving on further into the box, we have two decks of smaller Euro cards. So these are the cards for the actual characters themselves. And for those of you who know, there are only eight cards for each character and each um, card has a A side and a B side. And so that's it. So you just have eight cards for each one of the Mercs and that's all you get within the scenario. And once your cards are gone, they are gone. So. It's a very interesting mechanic and I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that runs in an actual game. In fact, it's not even the eight cards that you select. You only select a certain number of cards from that deck. Anyway, all becomes clear once you go through the process of learning the game. After that, you have more Euro-sized cards for the baddies. You've got your bandit guard, 
Banded Archer, Mouse, <laughs> nice. For any of you who have played um, Mice and Mystics, um, this game seems to basically be the missing link between a Gloomhaven style game and Mice and Mystics, which is pretty cool because I really enjoyed the concepts behind Mice and, Mice and Mystics. Um, but this kind of seems to be bridging that gap, which is really cool. And then because there aren't modifier uh, cards as such in this game, you instead use you know, the dice, you have these different cards for the difficulty. So this one says very easy, then this one says easy, there's hard and very hard, depending on focus, and hard and very hard, depending on how much you want to challenge yourself. And here are the modifier decks for each character. So uh, each of their symbols down the bottom corner there and uh, what their specific stats do, which is pretty awesome with regards to obviously the modification dice. So they all work in concert together. And in this packet, there are the, um, the cards for the other heroes that we haven't covered yet. So once you've opened up both the packets, you have the card decks for all six characters. All right, then uh, following that, you have your character card deck and various other things, I'm sure, within this bound little packet. So let's see if we can find the little edge and open it up. And nope, that was far more difficult than it needed to be. <laughs> Alrighty, so here we've got all the, actually the character boards essentially just made into card format. Now these are cards are your standard card size as you'd be familiar with in um, Gloomhaven or really a normal card game. So you have, you know, your card stats for each of the characters, the Craigheart, the Bruiser, Spellweaver, Tinkerer, Mind Thief, and the Silent Knife, being the knee scoundrel uh, person. And then you have a scenario deck. Now this is actually pretty cute because it's the same artwork as exists on the uh, books in the other games, but obviously it's a wee little deck. Whoop, <laughs> prone to flying out of your hand. So it gives you an introduction, it tells you exactly what to do in each scenario, and it takes you through the scenarios. So I'm just going to take that first scenario and get rid of the rest, just to give you a bit more of a detailed look on how the scenario deck works. Now it's actually the same format copied across all of the scenarios, so you're not missing anything by me not showing you the rest, I'm just not spoiling stuff. So on the first card it tells you, you know, the, the information about what's happening in the story at that stage, and the scenario and who you need. And then it just has a little map of the setup from the game board. So that is, the, that, is, that is your game board. That is where you will play the scenario. That's it, pretty cool. I guess potentially annoying if you needed to check something about your objectives or whatever. So you may have to remember that from the other side by the time you start placing uh, cubes and minis on here, you won't wanna mess with it but obviously you have you know, the scenario introduction card that you can always refer to, but anything on here will not be accessible to you after you have flipped it over to see the map. So for better or worse, that's how that works. And finally in the box, we have a bunch of thick cardboard. So, and then that's it. There's no envelope X.5 in this one. So the first one here is your character attack modifier uh, board essentially, which you will use the little white cube to track where you're at in any particular turn and that moves down as you go on. Then the one that looks very similar to it but in red is the monster modifier tray. So similarly, you will use a little white cube to note which layer of the modifier tray you're on. And next, there are four identical monster trays to keep track of the various monsters in the scenario and their modifier and where they're up to at any given time. And for these guys, you start off by putting the white cube on the zero for each one as you're setting up. And the little gap in there is for their actual monster card, such as that guy, for example. I quite like these little monster trays because they've got a little indent as you can see here, for the card to actually rest in. So that's a really nice design, and I, I like this glowing effect here behind the, the minus, the zero, and the plus. There's a few manufacture errors here, like there's a few little um, marks there and stuff like that. 
Nothing that probably wouldn't come into effect after a few games of play anyway, but just so you know. And on the backs, as just a lovely little skull. And the final two pieces of card in the box are the tokens. Interestingly enough, I feel like those tokens are only very slightly smaller than the ones you'll find in the actual gloomy, frosty games. And you'll be pleased to hear that unlike original Gloomhaven or Frosthaven or in fact any of the other havens, um, the stuff actually goes back into the box. <laughs> so if you've ever been camping and tried to fit a tent back into its original container and been, you know, bashing the hell out of it to get it in there, not the case with this. It actually fits perfectly into the box even without you having to muck around too much and perfectly aligning everything. So good work. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed that relatively in-depth look at Buttons and Bugs, the new Gloomhaven game. I, for one, am very much looking forward to getting my teeth into this, and uh, I'll see you next time for more content. See you guys.